Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome to the uh, April 11th meeting of the Board of Directors of the Washington Township Healthcare District. It's good to see you all here. If you'd all arise, will join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Nancy, if you'd like to introduce our educational session. I will be very pleased to do that after the roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I apologize. Minor item, but uh, <laughs> Dee, would you take the roll call? I'm sorry. Director Stewart. Present. Director Nicholson. Present. Director Epen. Present. Director Wallace. Director Danielson. Having got that, gotten that done, Nancy, if you'd like to introduce <laughs> the education session. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker tonight. His name is Dr. Tang Lee. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon, a member of the faculty at UCSF. Um, he's an associate professor of surgery in the Division of Adult Cardiothoracic Surgery. He was previously the co-director of the Aorta Center at the University of Florida. Prior to that, he founded the Center for Aortic Disease at the University of Maryland and also started the highly successful transcatheter aortic valve program there, which is known by its acronym TAVR. He's originally from Singapore. He graduated from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. He then went on to do a general surgical residency at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, where he was also the Dudley P. Allen Scholar before finishing his cardio cardiothoracic surgery residency at Duke University. He has also completed a fellowship in endovascular interventional radiology at Scon, I think it's Skane University Hospital in Malmo, Sweden, where he trained under the world-renowned uh, physician Krasi Ivansev and also had another fellowship in advanced aortic surgery heart transplantation, and mechanical circulatory support at Duke University. He is only a handful of hybrid specialists fully cross-trained in both interventional and open surgical techniques for the treatment of complex thoracic aortic disease. And as you can see from his curriculum vitae, he is eminently qualified to be speaking on this subject and taking care of our patients. Well, thanks for a very nice invitation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, before the board. I'd just like to um, go through some of the uh, exciting stuff uh, in mainly based of cardiac surgery that uh, we're doing at UCSF currently, and hopefully it will bring to uh, Washington Hospital uh, very shortly. So the, there's a transformation of cardiovascular surgeries uh, since the 1920s, when the, most of the uh, treatment of uh, heart disease is done in a closed fashion, what we call the closed era, where the, we can't access the heart itself, but we can open the chest and then put our finger um, across the heart. Uh, that's called a closed era. And in the 1950s, with the development of uh, cardiovascular, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass a circuit and machine, we're able to actually stop the heart and operate on the heart by open heart surgery, uh, meaning opening the heart and uh, doing whatever we need to do. And in the 1990s, um, there's this endovascular explosion where things are getting more uh, less invasive, where you treat the disease process uh, from inside the blood vessel versus from the outside of the blood vessel. And this trend uh, going back into the close uh, arena um, uh, also moved toward the transcatheter valve um, area as well. The benefits of uh, mid-invasive cardiac surgery uh, essentially is uh, there's generally less pain, um, there's early recovery, uh, hence earlier discharge from the hospitals and uh, cost savings. Um, we're also able to expand the pool of patients as older and sicker patients are not able to uh, tolerate traditional surgery and a lot of times they can tolerate a less invasive approach. 
There is, um, I heard this uh, quote from uh, a talk that was given by Dr. Ajahn Ziano about 10 years ago. Uh, he said, uh, there is a law of conservation of pain, and pain can neither be created nor destroyed. Mill-invasive and invasive cardiac surgery uh, transfer the pain of the surgery from the patient to the surgeon because it becomes more difficult from our standpoint, so hence more painful. So just a little introduction to the stuff that we're doing. I'm going to give you a little brief out, uh, overview of the anatomy. Uh, this is the aorta, which is the largest blood vessel uh, that come out from the heart. Um, this is the aortic valve itself, and then the entire thing is called the aorta. Um, thoracic aortic aneurysm, um, as you can see, this is a picture of it. Essentially, it's an enlargement of the blood vessel to at least uh, about one and a half times the normal diameter of the blood vessel. And the incidence is about 10 uh, per 100,000 person per year. And this is rapidly increasing because of the aging population and also because of increased detection with uh, increasing use of uh, CT scan in the emergency department. Aortic dissection uh, is a uh, very deadly disease. It's the most common uh, catastrophe affecting the aorta. Essentially, there is a tear uh, in the wall of the blood vessel. You can see this is like a bruised aorta. Um, so there's a tear in the, this is the blood vessel, and then there is a tear, it becomes a two lumen. And the management of thoracic aortic aneurysm and dissection in the past is very invasive. As you can see, this is open chest. The, um, the entire the chest is opened, and then the, aer the aneurysm was removed, and then this is uh, what remains is this, uh, the graft. Um, and this is the cardiopulmonary biosource machine that the patient is put on. As you can see the, from the circuit, it's a pretty invasive operation. Um, and this has really changed uh, when, uh, in the 1990s when endovascular technique come about. Um, this is a treatment uh, with the stent graft inside, and this is essentially um, in a low incision in the groin. Um, it's very tiny. Now essentially there's not much of an incision at all. This is just a little video um, of what that uh, is so that people can understand it a little bit better. This is taken from one of the company's uh, website. You can see the heart is beating. There is an aneurysm here, so this is enlargement. So every time there's an enlargement of the aorta, the, um, there is a higher chance of um, rupture or dissection because it's just like a balloon. The bigger it is, the, high, the higher the chance that it will rupture. And essentially, as you can see, this tank graph uh, reroutes the blood so that uh, there's no pressure on the aneurysm itself. And this is just ballooning to make it uh, a little bit closer uh, against the wall itself so there's no leakage around it. And these are just the blood, vest uh, blood as they depict here. And so this is essentially the end product. And this is all done through a tiny poke uh, in the groin. And um, even some complex stuff we can do with endovascular technique. Um, this is uh, experimental at this point, uh, but eventually will become a reality even in the ascending era. The, the, um, this has been approved in the descending currently and is done in the descending. In the ascending, it's uh, experimental at best. And this is some of the stuff that we have done at UCSF, um, where we replace the ascending aorta, and then the rest of it, uh, we use a stent graft to cover. This is what we saw earlier. And I'm uh, just going to jump uh, to another disease process called aortic stenosis. Essentially, it's a tightening of the aortic valve. You can see this is the aortic valve. Um, it uh, decreases the flow out uh, from the heart. A patient gets short of breath as the fluid backs up into the lungs, and also the people can pass out if the blood doesn't go to the brain. Or they get chest uh, tightness and pain if the decreased blood flow to the heart as well. So in the, for the natural history of aortic stenosis, uh, people um, die very quickly once there is an onset of symptoms. So heart failure symptoms mean short of breath, syncope means passing out, and angina with chest pain. But if you replace your valve, they mo you move this curve up um, to a more of a, a natural, uh, so essentially it prolongs life. Management of stenosis has several uh, options. Obviously, medical therapy uh, is a, um, 
most standard therapy, uh, we can uh, use a balloon to open the valve, but this is generally temporary. Uh, surgery is still the gold standard uh, to replace the, take the valve out and put a new one in. And then obviously the, the newest technique is a transcatheteric valve replacement called TAVR. Um, this is uh, just a standard stenotomy of an open heart surgery to replace a valve. This is an old incision. Uh, currently, the, um, Dr. Begi and myself uh, use a smaller incision, so um, people have less pain. It's a little bit more cosmetic. Um, so when we do open surgery, this is the incision that we make. Um, going deeper into transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Um, this is a technology that was first developed uh, in 1992 by actually a medical student who um, was at a meeting uh, with uh, percutaneous stenting and suddenly thought that why, why don't we do this for the valve as well. And he did the first experiment in pigs in 1992 and 2002, 10 years later, Alan Crevier, a cardiologist at, uh, in France, in Paris, performed the first in man uh, procedure. And this is just a little video presentation, again, taken from one of the websites from one of the companies that make the valve to make it a little easier to understand. You can see the heart is beating. The aortic valve is here. As you can see, it's pretty tight. The opening is not much. There's a lot of calcium, calcification around the aortic valve itself. So there's a, we poke uh, into the groin in the leg, uh, there's an artery there called the femoral artery, and then we sneak up a wire uh, through the heart, through the valve. And then uh, we pass out a balloon um, to open the valve a little bit more, to allow the, the, the new valve to go in. So it balloons it, opens it up. And essentially, this is all performed when the heart is beating, so there's no stopping of the heart, no opening of the chest, no opening of the heart. So this is the new valve that's coming up. <coughs> it's put across the old valve. And then deployed, so the old valve is pushed to the side. And you can see there will be a cross-section view in the shortly. So you can see the, the new valve is opening and closing, uh, working well. The, um, look at the opening now compared to what it was before. So patients generally almost uh, immediately feel better with a very uh, minimum-invasive uh, approach. Uh, Transcatheter aortic valve uh, has only only recently been approved in 2001. It was first approved to be used uh, by the FDA uh, for uh, patients that are not the operative candidate at all. In 2012, this expanded to high-risk patients um, that can have surgery, but they are considered high-risk. In 2016, it was actually approved for intermediate-risk patients as well, meaning a risk of dying uh, from surgery of about uh, 4 to 8 percent. And in 2016, uh, we are starting to do some studies uh, to evaluate, uh, to see where these valves are as good in the patients that are relatively low risk as well. And this is uh, just comparing open surgery versus the percutaneous technique. Uh, there are quite a lot of benefits. Uh, most patients don't even have to undergo general anesthesia. They can be just uh, slightly asleep. Um, there is no use of heart-lung machine. Um, there's just uh, no chest incision, just a little tiny poke in the groin. Uh, the valve is generally replaced within uh, about an hour to two versus the four hours in the past. Patients generally in the hospital very short, about two to three days, and then uh, versus about a week or so um, in the open uh, technique. And uh, for the open technique, patients won't feel better uh, about two to three months for them to recover from the surgery whereby patients that had the tavern uh, immediately feels better. Essentially, once they get up uh, that evening, um, they immediately can feel the difference. 
some of the, this is just a summary of some of the results. Uh, there is a, uh, in patients that are non-surgical, the TAVR decreases the mortality by 30% compared to uh, just standard medical therapy. In high-risk patients, um, the Atwood study suggests that it is somewhat equivalent to surgery. But uh, another company did uh, a different study with more patients. Uh, they actually show a slight 6% uh, improvement in mortality in these patients as well. For the intermediate risk patient, the mortalities for TAVR and surgery are somewhat similar currently. And the results for low risk patients are still unknown as a lot of the trials are still ongoing. And this group of patient uh, surgery is still the uh, standard uh, therapy. This is just uh, showing the 30% 30, uh, 30 difference in mortality. This is uh, just um, in three years, the mortality is 80% uh, with medical therapy and is about 50% uh, with uh, TAVR. This is an intermediate risk, sorry, this is in high risk patient and it shows that the, the risk of the, it's about the same, the results are about the same and this is uh, <coughs> in five years, the, uh, about 67% are dead and in, in the TAVR is about 62%. Sorry, in the tablet is 67% and then the surgical valve is 62%. And um, in this uh, uh, group of patients, this is uh, using the other valve, the core valve. They show that there is actually a difference in the high risk patient that uh, the mortality for the TAVR is actually lower, about 6% lower than uh, open surgical valves. So that's pretty much a tavern in a nutshell. Thank you very much. I had a question. Uh, what's the valve material in the tavern? Uh, valve material, the valve itself, it's, um, depends on the company. It's either the pig tissue or a cow tissue. It's a, it's a pericardium with a cow, generally. So it's really the same material that you it's the same in, material, in other but in it's open a, surgeries? It's in a cage. It's a cage that uh, used to be stainless steel. Now it's cobalt chromium alloy. Yeah. And then the other one is a nitinol, which is, uh, again, an alloy that's expandable. How long are those holding up compared to a, you know, a normal valve replacement? That's a good question. Um, we actually don't know exactly how long these will last because um, the, um, this has only been done recently, so they have lasted as long as we can tell so far. Good. That's always nice. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, just <coughs> first I wanted to say I've been very pleased with the uh, patients that I've had who've had TAVR and had excellent results with that. They're very happy with their procedures and have uh, done quite well. It's uh, amazing what a difference it makes for them. Um, but TAVR is a relatively new procedure and there can be complications. Can you tell us what the most feared complications are with TAVR as opposed to open surgery? And can you shed some light on what might have happened with our uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, who I believe was having a TAVR type procedure down at Cedars and required <laughs> emergency surgery? Yes. So uh, in terms of TAVR, the, the one of the things that uh, is higher in TAVR than open surgery is a need for pacemaker. Mm -hmm. So the need for pacemaker is significantly higher. In open surgery, the pacemaker rate is about 5% or so. In TAVR, uh, it ranges from about uh, 10 uh, to 25%. Mm -hmm. um, although pacemaker is a rather benign procedure that can be done um, with local sedation, but again, it's something that uh, uh, it's higher risk, obviously, and um, the risks are coming down over time as the newer generation valves are being made. Um, so currently, the best valves out there is about 10%. Mm. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, I think he had a previous uh, uh, pulmonic valve, and then um, I don't know the details of it, uh, but I heard that the, the valve actually embolized, and they had to go and take it out. I see. Oh, no, sorry. I think they actually ruptured as a balloon. They ruptured the... Uh, the annulus itself, and then they have to rush in and uh, do open surgery. Mm -hmm. So that uh, incidence of that is actually not very high in the tavern world. The incidence of uh, annular rupture is uh, less than one percent. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Maybe thank Doctor Maybe Doctor Choi has some questions or comments. Uh, no, actually, I've sent a couple people for tavern. They're all high risk because they were pretty early, or a couple years ago, and they've done very well. I've been very pleased. Yeah. Good. 
Thank you very much. It's been You're very welcome. informative. It's always nice to see procedures that are quicker, easier, and better for the patient. Sorry. Thank you. Mm. We'll now uh, move to a consideration of the minutes for March 14th, 26th, 28th, and 218. Uh, Mr. President, I move for approval of the minutes of March 14, 26, and 28. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Dee, would you take the roll? Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Wallace? Director Danielson? That motion passes. Thank you, Dee. Uh, now time for any oral communications that we have. Are there any that we're aware of? No, we don't have any. Good, thank you. We'll now move to Dr. Choi for the credentialing items. Uh, good evening. Um, for the credentialing items, surprisingly for new appointments, we actually have none for the first time that I've been doing this. Uh, for reappointments for two years, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Bala Anna Durai of Internal Medicine, Dr. Andy Chang of Family Medicine, Dr. Shrong Chang of Dermatology, Dr. Uh, J.S. Chang, Radiology, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Nurse Practitioner Kelly Franco, uh, Dr. Susan Su, Family Medicine, Dr. Mimi Lin, Radiology, Dr. Gabriel Miranda, Family Medicine, Dr. Lin Nang, Emergency Medicine, Dr. Vincent Ray, Ophthalmology, Nurse Practitioner Bernadita Rowe, Dr. Thomas Steckel, and Dr. Vivian Tsai. <coughs> For one-year reappointments, we have Dr. Uh, Riza Malik. There are no conditional reappointments or non-reappointments. Transfer and staff category, we have four. Dr. David Lee, hematology oncology. Dr. Taylor Morin Gates, intensivist. Dr. Carlos Perez, internal medicine. And Dr. Brian Shea, hematology oncology. Completion of proctoring and advancement and staff category. We have Dr. David Lee, Dr. Taylor Morgan Gates, Dr. Carlos Perez, and Dr. Brian Shea. Completion of proctoring prior to eligibility for advancement in staff category, we have Dr. Janelle Bennett, Hematology Oncology. Under deleting privilege requests, we have one, uh, Dr. Shirley Tsai, Pediatrics. Withdrawal of application, we have Joshua Lee, an intensivist. And resignations include uh, Dr. Uh, Johan Gray, Internal Medicine. That's the end of my report. Thank you very much. Do I have a motion for the approval of the Mr. credentialing Mr. items? Mr. President, I move for approval the, <coughs> of the credentialing action items as presented by Dr. Choi. Second. And we have a motion and a second. Uh, D, if you take the roll. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Wallace? Director Danielson. That motion passes. Uh, we'll now move to our service league report. Jeannie, it's a pleasure to have you here. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. And before I forget, I'm going to put this up. Masquerade jewelry sale coming up. A big event. Uh, end of April and the first two days of May. So there, um, we're looking forward to that. But anyway, last month I shared with you something I learned at our volunteer conference about the neuroscience studies that showed the link between compassionate care and better patient outcomes, health outcomes for our patients. That's uh, decreased need for pain medication, decreased anxiety, quicker healing, shorter hospital stays, and fewer readmissions, uh, just with that compassionate care. Mm -hmm. And uh, last month I was able to shadow one of our volunteers who is an uh, integral part of a new program that we started over a year ago. We had a really high census and the nurses were calling for help and so we developed this program called the Nursing Unit Assist Volunteer Program. <clears throat> and basically, the volunteers, 18 and up, uh, get to go up onto the nursing floors and provide non-clinical support for the staff and for the patients. And while they answer call lights and restock supplies, the really meaningful things that happen are when they can use that luxury of time and focus that volunteers have to spend time with the patients that need it. And <clears throat> we are really blessed to have a volunteer who came at, at the time that that program was just starting. 
and he has a gift for connecting with people. And so he's become the lead trainer to teach the other volunteers how to do what he does just so naturally. <clears throat> and just as an example, we have these scarves that volunteers make. And so he'll just, he'll just drape them over his arm and he'll, he'll go into a, a female's room <clears throat> very politely and just, you know, hello, you know, my name is Jim. Which one catches your eye? And they'll look at him and, well, well, I like that one. And, well, how much is it? And he goes, well, you know, it's, it's kind of expensive and not everybody can, can afford it, but I think you can. She says, well, what does it cost? And he goes, a smile. <laughs> and she smiles and he said, see, I knew you could pay for it. I knew you mm. could afford it. And just with that opening, <clears throat> very gently and, and kindly <clears throat> giving her a gift that, that we've made, put it, you know, she puts it on and just smiles and then they were, and he's able to sit and visit. And for those few minutes, there's no pain. There's, there's almost a transportation out of the hospital room and you're just friends that are visiting. And he has noticed that, and the other volunteers that are with him are just amazed because the room can be quiet when he enters, but when he leaves, there's chatter, there's talking, there's laughing, and it just continues, and it's very infectious, a good kind of infectious. <clears throat> so anyway, I just wanted to share with you that this program is starting, and volunteers are, are picking their floor whether it be third through the sixth floor, and they're becoming very familiar with the staff. The staff are becoming familiar with them. And um, they're getting to do what we, we, we want to have happen, where that connection is taking place. So anyway, I just wanted to share with you that uh, this is going on upstairs. Jeannie, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is really exciting. I uh, think it is. Very, yeah. very exciting. Yeah. Uh, we just, the board just read an article about the advent, advantages of uh, holding the hand of a patient that's in pain. Mm -hmm. uh, they've actually shown that there's a brain-to-brain -brain mm -hmm. mm -hmm. contact there. Yes. And uh, what you're doing is a very, very similar thing. Mm -hmm. uh, how wonderful. How wonderful. That's yes. great to hear. It's a real privilege. Yeah. And the masquerade jewelry sale. Mm -hmm. That's a high point in the... <coughs> The lives of my, of my wife <laughs> and, your, your and, my, <laughs> and my family. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but so it, it truly to. is. It's a, it's a fun, nice event. It is. It's a, it's a great fundraiser for the hospital. The community really comes out and supports it, so that's good. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much, Jeannie. We'll now have our medical staff report from Dr. Choi again. <clears throat> well, um, I'm proud to announce that we have uh, 341 active members with a grand total of 586 members on staff at present. Thank you, and no additions this month. That's a very unusual thing. Very I, can't, unusual. I can't remember that ever happening in my <laughs> tenure on the board. <laughs> we have a bunch coming more. up next month. Yeah. yeah, pardon? We'll make up for it next month. There yeah. you go, we'll count, we'll count on it 15 or 20 next month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Uh, Nancy, the hospital calendar. We'll start with the video, please. past health promotions and outreach events. During the month of March, Lucy Hernandez, Community Outreach Project Manager, provided nine hand hygiene presentations for students at Matos and Warwick Elementary Schools in Fremont. Information was provided on proper hand washing and hygiene to prevent infection and the spread of germs. 249 students participated. On March 15th and 28th, Dr. Tam Nguyen, Family Medicine, presented Obesity, Understanding the Causes, Consequences, and Prevention. 17 people attended. On Thursday, March 15th, as part of the Women Empowering Women series, Dr. Victoria Leapart, gynecologist, presented Prioritizing Your Life, It's Time to Get Organized. 11 people attended. On Saturday, March 17th, Washington Hospital hosted Stroke Awareness Day. This free event screened community members for carotid artery blockage, atrial fibrillation, as well as cholesterol, glucose, and blood pressure screenings. Dr. Jack Rose, neurologist and neurointensivist, provided results interpretation. Washington Hospital staff, volunteers from San Jose State School of Nursing, and the Washington Hospital Service League assisted to make this event a success. 
The event was co-sponsored by Fremont Bank Foundation. There were 87 community members screened. Of those 87, 15 were found to have mild blockages and 27 others were found to be at high risk for stroke based on other risk factors. On Tuesday, March 20th, as part of the Speakers Bureau program, Father Jeff Finley, Palliative Care Coordinator, presented Palliative Care, What You Need to Know to members of St. Joseph Parish. 32 people attended. On Thursday, March 22nd, as part of the Mental Health Education Series, Dr. Seema Sagal presented Understanding Psychotic Disorders. 47 people attended. On Tuesday, March 27th, Washington Hospital Outpatient Diabetes staff celebrated Diabetes Alert Day. The event aims to raise awareness of the seriousness of diabetes, particularly when left undiagnosed or untreated. Staff offered a one-minute type 2 diabetes risk test along with prevention education. The event took place in the lobbies at Washington Hospital and Washington West and the Washington Township Medical Foundation locations at the Nakamura Clinic and Newark Clinic. 143 people were screened. On April 3rd and 10th, Dr. Jason Chu presented Respiratory Health and Lung Cancer Prevention and Detection. 20 people attended. Also on Tuesday, April 3rd, Dr. Naveen Paul Body, Emergency Medicine and Wound Care Specialist, presented Wound Care and the Latest Treatment Options. 16 people attended. On Thursday, April 5th, as part of the Diabetes Matters series, Vita Reed RN hosted a questions and answers session on diabetic foot care. 22 people attended. Upcoming health promotions and community outreach events. On Thursday, April 12th, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Washington Township Medical Foundation Newark Clinic Conference Room, Dr. Victoria Leapart will present Stress Management. This seminar will also be presented at the Nakamura Clinic Conference Room in Union City on Thursday, April 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. On Saturday, April 14th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., Washington Hospital will host the 12th Annual Women's Health Conference. This event will feature topics such as female-specific stroke risk factors and prevention, an overview of improving your health and quality of life through surgery options, and tips for women to take action to discover a confident, healthy you. Fee to register is $25. To register, call 510-608-1301. On Tuesday, April 17th, from 10 a.m. to noon, as part of the Stroke Education Series, Melissa Reyes will present Stroke Prevention. Also, on Tuesday, April 17th, from 6 to 8 p.m., Dr. Amir Daska, podiatrist, will present Sick Feet, a health and wellness seminar about care for your feet and treatment options through the Washington Center for Wound Healing and Hyperbaric Medicine. On Thursday, April 19th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., as part of the Mental Health Education Series, Dr. Simone Madon, PhD, UCSF, will present When Depression Occurs with Other Medical Conditions. Other upcoming seminars include May 3rd, Mental Wellness, presented by Michelle Williams Smith, Senior Family Advocate, Family Education and Resource Center, and Dr. Victoria Leapart. May 17th, Family Support, Caring for Those with Mental Health Disorders, presented by Michelle Williams Smith. Also on Thursday, April 19th, from 7 to 8.30 p.m., as part of the Women Empowering Women series, Dr. Victoria Leapart will present Reclaiming Your Confidence, Body Image, and Self-Esteem. In celebration of Earth Day, Washington Hospital is hosting Let's Go Green Together on Saturday, April 21st from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Community members are invited to this free, family-friendly event to learn how simple acts can make you and your household more Earth-friendly. Residents can drop off unused medications, mercury thermometers, or old eyeglasses. For children, there will be games and activities to learn the impact of small earth-friendly acts. On Tuesday, April 24th, from 10 a.m. to noon, as part of the Stroke Education Series, Melissa Reyes will present Life After Stroke. On Friday, May 4th, 
Washington Sports Medicine will provide athletic trainers and host a first aid booth at the Special Olympics Track Tournament at James Logan High School in Union City. The Washington Hospital Healthcare Foundation Report. The foundation will host the 33rd annual golf tournament at Castlewood Country Club on Thursday, May 3rd. Held in memory of longtime Fremont businessman, Gene Angelo Pisano, the tournament promises a day of great golf and fun surprises. To reserve your foursome or to sponsor the event, please call Washington Hospital Healthcare Foundation at 510-791-3428. The Washington Township Healthcare District Board of Directors Report. Washington Township Healthcare District Board members attended the Alameda County Special Districts Association's annual dinner on March 22nd, the Indo American Community Federation's Unity Dinner on March 23rd, the Fremont Chamber of Commerce's State of the City Address given by Mayor Lily May on March 28th, and the Drivers for Survivors Annual Gala on April 7th. Washington Hospital Employees Association, WIA. During the month of March, WIA conducted their annual Sock and Undie Drive. This event is held to collect personal items for the homeless. WIA collected packs of assorted socks, undergarments, and other personal items for abode services and save. Washington on Wheels, WOW, Mobile Health Clinic. Washington on Wheels, WOW, Mobile Health Clinic is temporarily in Santa Rosa, California, helping support our North Bay neighbors who were devastated by October's wildfires. Santa Rosa Community Health serves 50,000 patients annually. The wildfires caused extensive fire, smoke, and water damage to its largest clinic, Vista Campus, and resulted in the loss of 56 patient exam rooms. The urgent need for temporary clinic space is the reason that WOW is now in Santa Rosa. Our mobile health clinic provides two temporary exam rooms. The mobile health clinic is expected to return to the district mid-April. Internet and social media marketing. Washington Hospital's website serves as a central source for information for the communities the district serves and beyond. The hospital's About WHHS was March's most viewed webpage with 37,177 views. The hospital's social media presence is measured through total reach and engagement stats. The total reach statistic represents the number of people who saw a Washington Hospital Facebook post. Social media posts may reach a user via a news feed, which is the most common, a user's page timeline, or via a direct link to a hospital post. The engagement statistic represents users who liked, commented, shared, or clicked on a Washington Hospital Facebook post. In Health, Channel 78. During the month of March, Washington Hospital's cable channel 78, In Health, captured new programming including two mental health education series programs called Understanding Mood Disorders and Understanding Psychotic Disorders. In addition, InHealth aired two health and wellness programs titled Women's Heart Health and Solutions for Weight Management and Surgery Options, two mental health education series programs called Crisis Intervention and Understanding Anxiety Disorders, and the March Board of Directors meeting. For more information on any of the programs mentioned, visit whhs.com or call 800-963-7070 and please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the April Employee of the Month, Patricia Latimer. And one of the nicest things I can say about her, besides the fact that she's a treasured Washington Hospital employee, that she is a quilter. <laughs> um, facing medical bills can be one of the more stressful things our patients and family members experience. And former patients can be confused or overwhelmed by the statements they receive. And it takes a very special person to be able to take a phone call from someone in this situation. And this is the job that Patricia has. Um, 
She joined our hospital family in 2006 as a per diem patient accounting representative. She became full-time in 2008. And her job, as you would understand, is both challenging and rewarding. Many of the accounts she handles are government payers, like Medicare and Medi-Cal, which have very complex billing regulations, which patients and families sometimes have a hard time understanding. Um, she says it's like I'm taking multiple puzzle pieces and fitting them together. And she tries to make a connection with each person that she speaks with. And this can mean carefully explaining the billing process multiple times. Um, I don't think there's anything more arcane than the federal regulations around Medicare and Medi-Cal. Um, the senior director of financial services, Sandy Adcock, describes Patty as having the patience of a saint. Um, according to Sandy, Patty is a valuable part of our department. Not only is she wonderful at resolving collection issues, she maintains sample training tools for both current and new employees. And her passion for quilting led her to the opportunity at Washington Hospital. She was at a quilt show with a fellow, with a friend and fellow quilter, Linda Renalson, who many of you might remember, when she heard there was an opening at Washington. The patient first ethic and the camaraderie of her coworkers are two things that she loves about her job. At home, she's someone who likes to stay busy. She enjoys the many stages of making a quilt. She's created nearly 100 quilts over the years. She's prolific including several as gifts for co-workers and family members. When not at the hospital, she often enjoys time with her husband of 35 years, Dave, taking trips to their cabin at Lake Tahoe. These trips always include Socrates, who is their 85-pound dog, and Kiwi, the talking bird, that became part of their family when it was still an egg. Visitors are sometimes surprised when Kiwi asks, what you doing? <laughs> or greets them with an irreverent, hey, baby. <laughs> Patty and Dave have raised two successful sons, Trevor and Sean. She also has a daughter-in-law, Gwen, but no grandchildren yet. So she's anxiously waiting to make that baby quilt. And we're very lucky to have someone like Patricia Latimer working for us at the hospital. We now have our lean report from uh, Donald Pipkin. Donald Pipkin is the Chief of Strategic Management, presented many times before us. Yes, thank you. Good it's good evening. to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So tonight we're going to present um, certificates and pins to the staff that have most recently completed their lean certification. Um, as we go through our lean transformation journey, uh, the purpose of lean certification really is to make sure that we have a group of staff and physicians who are not only experts in the tools and methodologies of lean, but can also help facilitate improvement work and also help teach the rest of the staff and physicians as well. Lean certification is an involved process. It takes about 12 to 18 months. Um, candidates have to show a proficiency in those concepts and tools, and they're evaluated throughout that process as well. Lean certification involves eight days of in-classroom teaching and training, participation in a value stream mapping workshop, which is a workshop that we use to look at the current state of a service line or process and then des design the optimal future state. They have to participate in one Kaizen workshop, which is really a week-long improvement workshop. And then they act at, have to act as a team lead for a Kaizen workshop and a workshop lead for a Kaizen workshop as well. So with that, I'd like to invite Nancy and Dr. Stewart up to present certificates and pins to our two candidates this evening. And the first one I'd like to invite up is Hisela Hernandez. Excellent. And the next I'd like to invite up is Angus Cochran. And 
that's it. Thank you. Now we'd like to have our construction report from Ed Fan, our senior associate administrator. Ed, it's good to have you. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. So um, I would, I would um, just pre preface my remarks by saying, as you see the photos uh, about to unroll before you, you can't help but start to get excited about the imminent opening. You can, things are starting to take a finalized shape, so I think you'll be pleased. So um, we're still scheduled. There's nothing really um, new. Um, we're moving forward with um, finalizing a lot of the work in the hospital itself. And as I've said I've, for several months now, the, th the connections are the things that are, will be the last things to be completed. So this is a shot of one of the um, x-ray rooms in the, in the um, emergency department. And you can see it's basically uh, close to finalized form and the equipment is uh, actually has been brought in and the x-ray rooms are getting equipped this week and a CT scanner I believe is coming by the end of the month and it takes about six weeks to finish that uh, installation. This gives you a shot of the main lobby and uh, what may be a little bit difficult to discern is the terrazzo flooring going in. So it's a white terrazzo floor um, and uh, they have put it in most of the, this floor. It's also going in some of the elevators. Um, this gives you a feel of sort of the, some of the finishing touches. So this is the atrium, but now it's got the glass uh, uh, in, in, um, installed. It'll have lighting uh, such that will uh, light up the atrium in the evening as well. And it's really, uh, it's really pretty spectacular. Uh, this gives you a view from one of the uh, floors. Here you have um, some of the uh, planting areas out on the terraces. You can see they've lifted I don't know how many bags of dirt up there a couple of weeks ago. It took them about three days. Um, so that's uh, waiting the plants to arrive. This is a shot of one of the waiting rooms on the third floor. You can see out to the atrium and the glass if you look through those windows. Um, and as I think I've stated before we have two of these waiting rooms right off the atrium on both the second and the third floor. This is an important one from the point of view of, this is one of the con connections I've talked about. So to orient you, um, this is the old employee entrance that is currently closed. Uh, but this was the main access for all the employees to get into the building. And this is basically the main corridor that will make its way over to the um, new hospital. Looks. Uh, nice and wide here. There is a little bit of a ramp that's going to be here for carts and such to come out of the elevator from the tunnel. It's, uh, for all these years since we put that in place, those have to run through the existing um, loading dock and out materials management. And so now they'll be able to come directly out and then out the corridors uh, and directly into the hospital instead of having to go through other departments. So this is going to be the main connection for flow of materials, patients, things like that. Obviously, the walls aren't on the side, but you can see that the roof and the concrete is down. This is the rest of a shot of the rest of the loading dock that's being completed, the extension of the existing. Um, and this is the east side. This is just a stairwell into one of the fire exits um, in the very back of the building over by the garage. And here you can see canopies in the very back. There's a canopy and an entry that's more of a combination employee entry. And this will be the thoroughfare if people are being sent out, um, being discharged via, via ambulance, being sent over to um, an outpatient MR or an outside MRI via, you know, uh, via um, ambulance. This is the way they're going to come in and out of the facility. Um, this is showing some underground utilities going in the road back um, between the garage and the, and the new building. And this is what is affectionately re referred to as the paper clip. <laughs> and what this is is actually directly in front of the emergency room ambulatory entry. And this, there is a rather steep drop. So this is going to be a retaining wall 
and we'll have three or four parking spaces here also a walkway that gets you from the upper uh, area from the lower area up to the emergency room you get a better view and can understand it's got this got this curve here and there's be other curve that went as it gets completed so it has sort of a paper clip look to it um, so the other thing to just note here is the entry will be in through here and this space is actually two vehicles wide for drop-off then it goes down to one vehicle to go out this way and this back in here is the main way in and out for ambulance and uh, fire traffic. So uh, that's kind of the flow that we're working on right now. Um, there we are. Any questions? You're right. It looks very exciting. It's so close. <coughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Just driving by, you kind of <coughs> kind of look in the windows and you can see things see what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I'm, I'm relieved to know what the paperclip is. I've seen those forms up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much, Ed. Any other questions for Ed? I think it, it also bears commenting that the staff with the, Ed's leadership are still on time, on budget. And that's rare for public works projects. <clears throat> very and rare. I think there's a lot to be proud of there. Thank you, Ed. We're now ready for a quality report. To make the introductions. We're going to hear a report on the emergency department, and we have two speakers tonight. I'm going to introduce both of them, and then they'll take over. The first person I'm going to introduce is Dr. Kadir Halimi. He's the medical director of our emergency department. He also serves as section chair in the emergency department, the chair elect for the Department of Medicine, and the co chair for our clinical operations readmissions committee. He was raised in Fremont. He's homegrown, where he graduated from Kennedy High School. He completed his undergraduate studies at the University of California, Davis, and attended medical school at Western University of Health Sciences, the College of Osteopathic Medicine in Pomona, California. He completed his residency in emergency medicine at Texas A&M. He is the founder and president of Orphan House Foundation, since 2010, which takes care of orphans in Kabul, Afghanistan. The orphanage was recently ranked number one in Kabul by the European Union. Dr. Halimi has been with Washington Hospital Healthcare System since 2004. Also with him this evening is Brenda Brennan, RN. She received her nursing diploma from Little Company of Mary Hospital in Chicago, her bachelor of nursing from Chicago State University and her master's degree in nursing from UCSF. She started her career at Washington Hospital in August of 1987. As a registered nurse in the emergency department, in February of 1989, she assumed the role of clinical nurse specialist for the emergency department. In 2014, she was promoted to the position of emergency services administrator. In this role, she has responsibility and accountability for the overall strategic and operational planning and provision of patient care for our emergency department, observation unit, and our future trauma services. In July of 2017, she was promoted to assistant chief nursing officer. She's been at Washington Hospital for 30 years and has been a very active person in many of our institutional initiatives, including but not limited to disaster preparedness and our lean implementation. With that, I'll turn the program over to Brenda and Dr. Halini. Good evening. Thank you for that uh, very well um, introduction. Um, I want to thank Ed for showing us those pictures. That really got me excited. Um, looking forward to going into our new home um, and uh, continuing what, uh, what work we're doing. So this evening, I want to thank the board, thank uh, Ms. Farber for giving us the opportunity to share with you guys some of the progresses that we've made um, in the last uh, calendar year uh, in the Mercy Department. Um, starting off with our census. Um, uh, as mentioned, I've been here since 2004. And when I started here, um, 
our volume was mid 40s i think 45,000 patients or so and each year steadily we've increased our volume um and uh, in uh, about average about six percent which um, about 2700 patients which amounts to about uh, 560 uh, more admissions to the hospital um, our daily average census is about 146 patients uh, with the highest um, as high as 100 about 160 patients we um, discharge about 80 percent of our patients as you can see on the graph uh, about 19% of our patients are admissions, which include inpatient as well as observation, um, and about one-third of our patients um, are uh, fast-track patients. Um, what this slide, although it's a little busy, uh, attempts to show is that we see sick patients. Uh, uh, Washington Hospital, um, being a very high-acuity emergency department um, in Alameda County, and uh, compare that to other hospitals around the nation, our average ESI, or our emergency severity index, shows that we see sicker patients that are older uh, compared to the rest of the nation. Um, not only do we take care of sicker patients, but we um, do that in a very efficient manner. Um, and um, that's shown by how fast we're able to take care of um, ambulance uh, that, that arrive at our doors. On average, uh, we're the fourth highest number of um, we, we take the fourth number of uh, ambulances to our facility, and despite that, we, we do it faster than any, any other high-volume emergency department around the county, which really tells you something about our um, care in the emergency department, which is not just done by me or the physicians. It's the nurses, the ancillary staff, the hospital staff, uh, administration. Um, you know, patients arrive, and if we can't dispo them, then you can't take more patients. So that, this slide to me shows that we're efficient in what we do and we do it with the help of everybody um, uh, in the hospital um, we are also blessed to have a program that um, we started in 2013 uh, again headed by uh, Ms. farper which whom we um, owe grat gratitude to and since its inception in 2003 we basically have tripled our volume um, we're um, one of two programs in um, serving alameda county as far as providing sart um, uh, services. Uh, we have uh, seven um, uh, SART nurses that are trained that are on call 24-7. Um, and in the last two years or so, and Brenda can attest to this, um, we're seeing a steady increase. Not only that, but the feedback that we're getting from the police officers and the detectives is they prefer to come here because our facilities are much better. Um, uh, they're just more comfortable for the, these patients who are in, really in a bad uh, situation and a bad time in their lives. So to me, this is a really integral part, um, not only for our Tri-City area, but for the whole county. Uh, and certainly I appreciate you providing the service for us and for the community. Um, operations and processes, um, you know, just like I said, it, truly, you know, the old adage saying it takes a village. Uh, we have our um, emergency department clinic operations committee, uh, which really uh, meets um, on a monthly basis. Uh, and I would say sometimes on a daily, daily and weekly basis. I mean, uh, Brenda's on my favorite calls on my cell phone, you know, if that tells you anything. <laughs> so, you know, we meet, you know, Stephanie, I don't know if she's in the room, she's awesome. You know, every time we need help, we, we call on Stephanie to help us. Um, Brenda Brennan, who um, he, he needs no introduction. Michael Bestbecker, who's our assistant nurse manager. I'm sorry, who has our, uh, who's our uh, ED manager. Uh, Noemi Gonzalez, uh, myself being the director. Um, Dr. Bamani, who's our um, president for our emergency physician associates, um, who've, um, has been integral in kind of bringing a new culture and new way of, of taking care of problems, integrating and getting more people involved. Um, nurses, uh, Anthony Ellis, Betty Goodwin, Carmen Harapishian, uh, Cristobal uh, Will, and other nurses who are really, not, if they're not on this list, doesn't mean they're not helping. I mean, truly, you know, one of the things that I've actually heard, and I kind of want to go off on the tangent a little bit, is we've had a, a few new physicians come on board. And, you know, every two to three months after they come on, I email them and say, what do you like about here? What can we do better? And bar none, the best thing, the, the, the comments is, this is some of the best nurses that we have, um, they've ever worked with. So thanks to Brenda and, and, and the ancillary staff for, our nursing staff is phenomenal, uh, hands down. And I work at three other facilities, and I can tell you, um, BSN, they're magnet trained, they're, they take care of patients. Um, so I rely on them. I rely on them to take care of my own family members. So I certainly want to give them a, a, a big round of applause. Um, 
So thank you. So thank you to everybody, Doctors uh, um, Corey Lam and Kevin Morrissey, uh, other physicians that are involved. And Dr. Morrissey being our uh, assistant medical director is um, highly involved in quality and, 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 and is, is integral to this whole process. Um, now another subject that's kind of dear to my heart is opiate crisis. Um, I know this has come in light um, lately. Uh, it's become a national crisis. But I remember when I started my residency in 2001, um, the CD, the Joint Commission, you know, started really promoting um, pain management. We heard about pain being a fifth vital sign. We heard about um, treating pain doesn't really um, have high risk for addiction. Uh, really, we're being pressured to treat patients um, to the point that management companies and insurance companies weren't paying the treatment of pain if it wasn't being treated by narcotics um, or if it was treated by NSAIDs or acetaminophen or other medical treatments. And as this rolled on over the years, it really became to a point where um, if patients came to the emergency department, and I personally can tell you this, and I didn't treat them to the point that they felt they'd be at Nancy's door knocking and saying, you have a physician that's not giving me pain medicine. And that was difficult to do, right? So do I give them pain medicine uh, and risk their lives, or do I get a complaint to um, somebody who is higher up. So it was a really hard position to be at. And you know, I, and I think um, we, we fought this the best we could, and um, now the tide has changed. I mean, this really truly is a national um, crisis uh, around, the, around the country, and I think um, we, we start to look at it as other emergency departments and other health facilities did around the country. Um, we um, started participating in Alameda County Safe Prescribing Initiatives, we have all our physicians um, registered with Curis, which is a database that tracks all prescriptions that are prescribed uh, around uh, California. Uh, Ms. Farber was kind enough to give us a, um, the ability to access EDI, which is another program that we can immediately see a patient and where they've been on the West Coast. I mean, I see patients, in the beginning, I used to see patients as far, that's been as far as away as Washington down to LA and they'd be just going from one place to another. You can just kind of track where they're going. And we were the next one under stop. And over the last year or so, it, that has decreased. And our rate of um, opioid prescriptions has dropped by 50%. I mean, that's, to me, that's incredible. It's not that, it's, it just tells you that, it's not that we're not providing care, we're providing better care. Um, our rates of patients who are frequent flyers, so to, so to speak, which I don't like that term at all, because I think all patients have needs. Their, their rates of coming back um, have and getting prescription um, uh, for narcotics have decreased. So to me, that's a big step um, towards providing better care for patients. With that, I'm going to give it to you. It's a shame we don't like each other. So um, th there's been a lot of change in the emergency department in the last several years, but most significantly in the past year, there's been a change in physician leadership. We've become better partners. We had a consulting group come in called Quality Matters, and they really came in to do some work with the physician group, and they made some significant recommendations, and this slide tells you about some of the things that we've changed. One of the things that we implemented based on analysis is having um, a physician in triage. Now, we're hampered by the ability to do that in our current setting because of the triage modular and licensing. In a surge, we are able to have the ER doctor go out to the building, initiate some orders so that by the time the patient gets back to a room, then they have results that are back already. In the new ER, we're going to have a concept called team triage where we'll have a nurse, a tech, a physician in triage, be able to provide rapid medical screening exams, get tests ordered, and improve our length of stay. We are looking to segment and stream our patient population. We already have fast track. With the addition of more beds in the emergency department, we'll be able to streamline and be able to care for our mid-level patients that um, don't need to take up a gurney and they can wait for lab results. We will have advanced practitioners in the new emergency department. The physicians have started the process of bringing NPs in through the um, medical staff. We implemented scribes in the fall that improved our documentation for the physicians. They're able now to have a note in the charts 100% of the time for all admissions in the emergency department before they leave for the day. And it's improved 
physician satisfaction. Yeah, see, he's smiling. And then we opened a clinical decision observation unit last January, and we've been very successful in managing that patient population with an average length of stay of 18 to 19 hours. We were one of the second, we were the second value stream for lean and Kaizen workshops. And we begged actually to be one of the first ones because we knew that there was room for improvement in the emergency department. And if we could have done it by ourselves, it would have happened already. We really needed that team approach and those lean tools to help us analyze and re-envision the future. As a part of lean and lean leadership, weekly every wednesday michael platzbecker holds a process owner board weekly he has to provide instruction about the lean methodology because we have so many new employees that come through the department and we go over our current metrics it's a shared board uh, we go over registration metrics we go over er specific metrics and we've included some metrics with radiology as well because we're so interdependent in addition to the process owner board, we have an improvement board, which is on the flip side of the hallway. And that improvement board is really significant to our emergency department. It really improves our transparency. We have transition times up there right now. There's a um, information sheet that goes to all the staff to let them know where we're at in terms of transitioning the emergency department to the new building. We have a lot of uh, nurses and physicians that work in other locations and all ideas are welcome, right? We haven't cornered the market on knowing everything here at Washington Hospital. The other thing that if you came into our department and saw this board, there's a pocket for recognition where people can recognize their coworkers. Every week that pocket is full of nurses recognizing each other, recognizing physicians, other departments, and so it's a real cohesive team building type of activity. One of the things we've implemented in the past several years and, and keep trying to perfect is how do you manage that busload of patients that comes in? We're unable to predict the future. It's not a real bus, though that was part of our history back one day, but we can receive as many as 16 to 18 patients in an hour, which is a lot of patients and requires a lot of coordinated effort. Sometimes all our treatment areas are full. We've changed our criteria over the years. We, there was always that guess, how many patients does it take to make a surge? Is it three patients that's waiting? Is it 10 patients that waiting? Is it two hours in the waiting room? And so most recently, we've modified it to be anybody that's waiting more than 30 minutes in the waiting room without a bed available in the department is criteria to call a surge and have a physician see the patient in the triage modular and get things moving. And, and that's been really very successful. Um, we also have the ability to call in physicians that live close. Dr. Lamb, Dr. poor Dr. Halimi, um, has come in, worked four hours here during a surge, and then gone to work down at O'Connor at another job. So the ER physicians are very committed to helping with the volume that you, you can't staff to the worst day ever, right? You just have to have a plan to be able to deal with it when it happens. And then we're very integrated with the rest of patient care services because we can clean our own house, we can manage as best we can, but if we can't find real estate upstairs to disposition our patients, we can't get the rest of the patients in. And so there were a lot of things that patient care services put in place this past winter that made um, the high volume almost imperceptible to other departments. We started a 9.30 in the morning discharge um, huddle in the nursing staffing office. Uh, we rehuddle again at noon, and it's made a difference in terms of our discharges and being able to transition patients. So once you have a lean event, doesn't mean that you're done with lean, right? We have totally embraced lean in the department. It's a, a part of our vocabulary to the point we can't even remember when we didn't use lean vocabulary. One of our last events was optimizing our fast track operations. And what this slide shows you is that we've decreased our length of stay from 97 minutes to 81 minutes, that um, the time from their arrive has gone from 22 to 16 minutes by the time we get them in a room, and that we're almost in half the amount of time it takes for the doctor to be able to get the medical screening exam done. And really our goal is what, what pieces in the process can we eliminate that gets the patient to the provider sooner? Because those patients did not come to see the reg clerk, they didn't come to see the triage nurse, they came to see Dr. Halimi. Some of them asked for him by name. <laughs> this is a slide that I'm incredibly proud of. In, in the past, when I would do a quality report for the emergency department and would have to report on the patients that leave without being seen, 
almost universally, the, the number of patients that left without being seen was direct, directly reflected in the census for the department and how many admissions we have. And I'm really proud to say that despite the census increasing and increasing admissions and really being saturated in the department, that our left without being seen are below 1%. The national goal is less than 2%. And the first time that I calculated this, I had to do the math five times. I was sure that I had run the report incorrectly. There was no way that we could be at half a percent for left without being seen. And we have sustained this. This is data to December of 17. We have sustained it through high census of January, February, and March. And that really is because of the combination of keeping our foot on the gas all the time and constantly doing small tests of change every single day. What can we do to change this process? What if we put a doctor there? What if we put two techs there? What if we use our techs to do the transport? Just always doing that analysis together to see what can we do to improve the process. Quest for Zero, I, I would imagine most of you are familiar with this. It's a program that we do with Program Beta, our liability carrier. We've participated for about six years at this point. We've gotten five awards. And let me tell you, getting an award from Program Beta for this is not an easy task. The very first step is that you have to get 100% of the physicians and the nurses to complete a learning module. All of them. If you miss one person, you don't get the award. So five years in a, war, in a row, we've had great cooperation. They get done a little bit earlier every year. We complete the chest pain education module, and then there's additional activities that we do for the Tier 2 credits. Um, in the past year, we've um, educated 81 nurses, 18 physicians. The number will be even higher this year because we've added to our ranks. And the benefit is to the nurses and the patients, we've implemented many of the things that we've learned through program beta, but there's also a financial benefit for the organization as well in terms of a, a discount on the premium every year. So what are we doing next? Well, like Dr. Halimi said, we meet all the time. So we have a monthly clinical operations meeting, but it's no joke that we talk almost every single day about what happened yesterday, what could we do better today, and what might we change tomorrow. We're doing Quest for Zero again this year, which is challenging on top of all the other work that we're doing to move into the new building. Um, Beta was here just last week on Thursday and Friday to do a risk assessment for the emergency department. I'm proud to say that they were impressed. Um, it was very infirming. We got some questions answered for ourselves. There's always room for improvement. We're not perfect, but they were happy with what we're doing in the emergency department from a risk perspective. We'll implement emergency nurse practitioners, preferably before we move into the new building. We'd like to have as many processes hard hardwired before we move so that we're not doing everything new. We've got some um, research that we're involved in. We're participating with UCSF to implement a pediatric asthma program. We're working with pharmacy. They've implemented designated pharmacy tech in the emergency department on day shift and night shift and pharmacists on evening shift. So we have 24-7 coverage now, and it's really been of benefit to the patients because we're able to get an accurate medication list so that ER physicians can accurately order the medications they need until they're seen by their primary care provider. Thank you very much. Thank you. To, thanks to both of you. That's a wonderful thing. Are I've. Uh, I don't. No, no questions, but... Boy, I love it. <laughs> I really love it. The, the thing I really like uh, that, that's helped me in what I do is uh, the scribes, because I get a narrative story of why that patient showed up to the right. ER. So, and you get that on a timely basis. So that's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. All good changes for yeah. better yeah. and for better patient care. Right, yeah. I've had two interactions family-wise with the ED in the last year. Yes. Those are things you don't look forward to. <laughs> but it's, it's been wonderful. Thank great you. Great care, great people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. And this is in the second busiest emergency room mm -hmm. in Alameda County. And they've been able to do all of this. It's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. It's good. We'll now have our finance report from Chris Henry. Chief Financial Officer. 
Okay, good evening. So tonight we'll be looking at the uh, results of operations and the financial results for Washington Hospital for February. We'll move right into our acute inpatient statistics. Average daily census for the month was lower than expected. Uh, we had an average daily census of 170.3. We'd expected about 186. Um, admissions for the month were 15 below budget at 1,015. Patient days were 459 below budget at 4,767. Uh, our outpatient observation equivalent days continued with the trend we've seen all year, 72 below budget at 110. And also our average length of stay, uh, we've seen a, a shorter length of stay trend all year there uh, at 4.64. Looking at utilization case mix index for the month, really um, lower than we generally see in February at 1.414. Uh, we had 143 deliveries in the month, 11 higher than budget. Uh, surgical cases came in 21 above the budget uh, at um, 365. That includes our joint replacement cases that were 17 above budget at 150. Our neurosurgical cases were 10 below budget at 15. Cardiac surgical cases in February came in at 11. We had expected 14 in the month. Uh, cath lab procedures were 56 below budget at 287. Our outpatient visits for the month were uh, 297 above budget at 6,849. Emergency room was pretty close to budget at 4,175 for uh, the month. Quick look at cath lab activity for the month. You know, peripheral, vascular, and cardiac kind of flip-flop. Who, uh, who had the highest percentage this month? It was cardiac at 41% of the activity, uh, peripheral, vascular at 40%, followed by uh, the interventional radiology uh, product lines. Looking at productivity, um, productive FTEs for the month came in 122.8 below budget at 1,262.3. We had 186.7 non-productive full-time equivalents for the month, giving us total FTEs that were 119 below budget at 1,449. Uh, and a full-time equivalence per adjusted occupied bed, which is our productivity measure uh, at 6.39, pretty close to the budget at 6.43. Moving into the financials, and as always, we'll look at the Governmental Accounting Standards Board presentation first. This is the presentation we use for our audited financial statements. Um, total patient revenue for the month came in 7.7% below the budget at $159,440,000. Contractuals for the month uh, came in very favorable at 74.97%. Uh, we really had a favorable payer mix. Um, uh, uh, the government percentage of gross revenue was at 69.1%. I can't remember when it was that low uh, before. And our PPO was uh, up at 25.7% uh, at, uh, for the month. So that all added up to really favorable for our contractuals. Uh, we also, this is the time of year we start looking at our contractual reserves and start making adjustments to them as we come into year end. Uh, so we did make some adjustments there that, that pulled that down a little bit. So we ended up the, the month, even though our gross revenue was down, we ended up with net operating revenue about $269,000 above the budget at $40,379,000. Operating expenses for the month came in a little bit more than $2.1 million below budget at $38,207,000. Uh, big drivers there were our labor uh, costs, you know, with the lower FTEs, uh, just didn't need as many people in the house. Uh, so uh, that was about $2.3 million favorable variance. That was offset by our supplies. Um, supplies for the month were $283,000 above the budget. Uh, and one of the main drivers there, we've been talking about the IV, solu the IV solutions, the saline solution issue that's been going on. You know, really, <laughs> I can't say this definitively, but, but if anything smelled like market manipulation, this is it. You know. If, this is not a complicated product, and Dr. Nicholson, you may correct me on this. I believe all it is is sterile salt water. Exactly. Um, uh, so first we were hit with shortage, shortages of sterile salt water. Excuse me, that's a tongue twister. Uh, 
And now it's um, sterile plastic bags that is the excuse, uh, that there's a shortage of sterile plastic bags to put it in. Chris, I think a lot of this was due to the uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, Some of it was due to Puerto Rico, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we were experiencing this off and on before that. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, we, we spent, even though our activity in the house was down, we spent $189,000 more than we expected on saline solution. Um, uh, we also had, uh, with our higher joints, some prosthesis costs that drove that up. Um, uh, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, I meant to mention, um, the benefits uh, variance of a million dollars was in the health and welfare uh, area. Uh, we had seen that number through December really dramatically over budget, and now it's swung the other direction. So um, that seems to be uh, leveling out a bit for us. Um, provision for bad debt and charity for the month was about $88,000 over budget. Uh, private pay as a percentage of gross revenue was 2.3% versus a budget of 1.7. So we're continuing to see a little bit of elevation there. But anyway, we ended up February with a, with a pretty good uh, operating bottom line. We'd expected a small loss in the month of $231,000. We ended up with a, with a positive bottom line of $2.172 million. Um, Non-operating income for the month came in $538,000 below budget, largely driven by an unrealized loss on our investment portfolio as the activity there continues to defy logic. Um, so we ended up the uh, month with a total bottom line, uh, almost a million nine above the budget at $3,365,000. Quick look at our uh, FASB presentation. Uh, th this is a representation of the adjustments that the financial markets might make to look at our financials. Um, they don't change our operating bottom line, but they do look at the non-operating area and they pull out that unrealized loss on investments and they pull out the uh, tax revenue that supports the, the uh, interest payments on our general obligation bonds. So from a FASB perspective, we end up with non-operating income about $93,000 below the budget at 283,000 and a total net income for the month, uh, about $2.3 million above the budget at $2,455,000 from a FASB perspective. So are there any questions on February? Report. Always nice to have good reports. Nancy, on the. This isn't going to be nice. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. <laughs> Did any of you see the Warriors game last night? <laughs> it's kind of like that. Oh. Um, well, we I had, well, we had you. a good. We had a good report. <laughs> <laughs> now, we'll, now we'll hear the operations. We let Chris report. bring all the good news. Yeah. Um, the operations report for March um, is difficult. There are only three numbers I'm going to show you that were at or above budget. <coughs> um, we'll start with gross revenue. Um, was It was below budget by $20.3 million, or 10.5%. And while we'll get to it in a, a few slides, the payer mix has a lot to do with this besides volume. Um, inpatient gross revenue was $13.6 million below budget, and the outpatient gross revenue was 42.2 million below budget. In terms of the major drivers of the revenue variance, um, inpatient days came in below budget by 492 days, or 8.6%. Observation days were also below budget by 81. Inpatient surgical volume came in below budget by 22 cases, or a 7.1% um, below budget. Um, our revenue for surgical services was down by 4.2 million. Cath lab procedures are also below budget by 37 cases a 9.6% negative variance, and it drove our cath lab revenue below budget by 2.3 million. The overall lower level of acuity, uh, I'm sorry, of activity drove ancillary services revenue below budget by $8.6 million. In terms of our average length of stay, 
We had budgeted 5.08. We came in at 4.66. Um, it was shorter than March a year ago. Our outpatient observation days were below budget. Um, uh, by 81 days or 37%. Average daily census of 169.2 was below the budget of 185.1. So the average daily census was 25.4 below March a year ago. In terms of admissions, um, we had 4% fewer than we had budgeted. Patient days, 5,245 were below budget by 492, and they were below March a year ago. The surgical trends, um, we had surgical cases numbering 376, and they were below budget by 22 cases. Um, they were also below March a year ago. Inpatient surgeries were 22 below budget. Outpatient surgeries were on budget. That's one of the few numbers I'm gonna give you today that's okay. Our general surgical cases were below budget by 10. The neurosurgical cases were below budget by six. Cardiac surgical cases were below budget by five. And joint replacement surgeries were below budget by one. Cath lab procedures for March were 37 in number, below budget. And they were also below March a year ago. Inpatient cath lab procedures came in at 165 and they were below budget by 18. Outpatient cath lab procedures were also below budget. They were below budget by 19. Cardiac procedures in the cath lab were above budget by five. Non-vascular interventional radiology procedures were below budget by seven. Neuro-interventional radiology procedures were below budget by eight. Peripheral vascular procedures were below budget by 27. Um, one of the issues associated with that was a key surgeon being on vacation. He was out of town for a week. Deliveries for March numbered 145, and they were below budget by two. So close. Um, Non-emergency outpatient visits of 7,738 came in below budget by 276. That's a 3.4% negative variance. Um, the lab visits, ta-da, were above budget by 80. OB visits were above budget by 42. Non-emergency short-stay visits were below budget by 99. X-ray visits were below budget by 240. Infusion center visits were below budget by 50. The emergency room visits of 4,490 came in below budget. Our budget had planned for 4,715. Our productivity indicators. Um, productive FTEs came in below budget by 86.2 at 1,307.8. Non-productive FTEs were below budget by 17.2. Total FTEs of 1,445.6 were below budget by 103.4. Total FTEs per adjusted, adjusted occupied bed came in at 6.46 and were above budget by 0.21. Um, our, our patient surgery center had 533 cases in March. This is the third figure that came in above budget. Um, they had budgeted 506, so they had 27 more cases than we had planned. Clinic visits of 3,777 were below budget by 502. Now, this is where we get to the pair mix, and you can readily see how this is going to affect our projected revenue figures. Government-sponsored patient revenue made up 74.4% of total gross revenue. That's huge. 
Um, I'm not quite sure where the trip wire is, but I think if we got much above 75%, we couldn't make money no matter what we did. I think as everybody understands, neither Medicare nor Medi-Cal pay the full cost of care, and they count on insurance companies subsidizing the hospitals. Um, we had budgeted government sponsored patient revenue at 72.5%, so you can see what a difference this makes for us. HMO revenue was 2.4% of our gross revenue. Um, that came in below the budget of 3.0. PPO revenue was 20.9% of gross revenue, which was below the budget of 22.7%. And those few percentage points make a very big difference for us. Also, uh, confirming the trend that we've been discussing is private pay revenue is creeping up, and it was 2.3% of gross revenue compared to a budget of 1.8. And I would expect that to grow as the assault <coughs> on um, federally sponsored health care continues. Days cash on hand for March ended at 173 days. It was down two days from February, but that's not so bad given that we had three pay periods in March. Our days of gross revenue and accounts receivable were 55. The business office is doing its job, and it is to be commended for those numbers. There were $279,000 in charity care applications pending or approved in March. Rugged month. Thank you, Nancy. Any questions for Nancy or Chris? I will tell the board that we've already had um, an executive staff meeting. We started reviewing where the shortfalls in activity have come and we'll be tightening belts accordingly. We're not going to wait for um, Another month. April to go by. So this afternoon at four o'clock we had a meeting and we will be addressing it as directly as we can. Great, great. That brings us to the end of the open agenda for t tonight. We now adjourn to a closed session. We'd like now to reconvene to open session and announce that no reportable action was taken in the closed session this evening. There being no further business, this meeting is adjourned.